Welcome to Higher Praise. I guess we'll get started. Certainly a pleasure to be back and see you all again tonight. I missed you all last week. But uh, anyhow, we'll, uh, we had a beautiful, beautiful day. And uh, where you notice or not, it was a brilliant red evening sun. So you should have a fair day to travel tomorrow if you're not going too far. So if you're around this part of the world, it'll be a nice day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for such beautiful fall weather. We, Lord, we've been blessed so much this fall. Uh, just tremendous fall weather, and, and we appreciate that, and we thank you for that. Lord, as we look forward to starting the Thanksgiving and Christmas season tomorrow, we just ask that everyone will stop and reflect upon where they are and what they actually have to be thankful for. And we just ask, Lord, that the Spirit will flow into more and more people every day during this fall and winter period, and that we really will have a time of reckoning between now and the first of the year, that people will see you for what you are and what you offer for us. And we ask, Lord, that you help all of us to just look upon each other with total and compassionate love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we'll jump in. Um, appreciate Pastor taking place for me last week. Um, I know Pastor and I, we email stuff back and forth quite a bit, and I think we read about 99% of the same things all the time. So he's, uh, he's got the bug as bad as I do to trying to be on top of things, and needs to be. A pastor needs to be on top of what's happening so that as things unfold, uh, got an opportunity to prepare and and to have a level of understanding that will promote peace and and peacefulness for the people that may be getting uh, involved and may be upset by what's going on start out tonight we talk about one thing that's happening worldwide we we talk about the christian persecution and it is it's terrible uh happening uh i'll mention here in a minute that turkey uh this week is uh, bombing and, and sending artillery shells into uh, Iraq and Syria, and they're attacking mostly Christian Kurds, are the ones that's on the receiving end of that. And, and so, but they're, they're just persecution everywhere. But one thing that doesn't get, it's gotten some coverage here in the States, but not the level it should be, is the Jewish persecution that's taken place. And it's worldwide, uh, to the point that here in the United States, um, Jews are afraid to walk the streets in some cities. Uh, there's been attacks in, in New York, in Chicago, uh, all across the United States. There, there's a lot more going on. I don't follow the news here in the States on it as much. I'm just picking up some of the high points. Worldwide, it is going on at a tremendous rate, to the point that right now, most of the Jews in Europe are looking to leave Europe. And in fact, they are in droves. Uh, Aliyah, which is the uh, Hebrew term for the people coming home uh, to Israel, is at an all-time high. And uh, the war in Ukraine, <clears throat> the war in Ukraine has just uh, accelerated this. But there are tremendous Jewish attacks taking place around the world, and it's really sad. Uh, there's, and, but there's going to be more of that. Uh, just as there is more persecution on the, uh, the Christians, knowing that God's bringing his people home. So this is just another tool he's using to bring his people home. Uh, not that they want to maybe leave where they're at to go there, but to the point that for the safety and security of their families, they feel like they have to. And it's obvious if you stop and think through it, that can very easily be part of God's plan to bring more and more of the Jews back home every day. And that's what's going on at a high rate. While we're talking about the Jews, we'll just stay in the Mideast. This is what's really sad. Um, the attacks, the Palestinian attacks, Hezbollah and Hamas on Israel and on Israelis has really taken a sharp uptick. Uh, there was a bombing today. I think there have been three bombings this week. There's been quite a few people injured. There have been people killed. And you know what uh, happens when 
one of the terrorists gets into the Israeli territory and, and has a bombing or a shooting or a knifing and kills someone? What's the Palestinian response? Have you seen that? Not only do they clap their hands, they fall out in the streets and hand out candy celebrating that a Jew was killed. Now just stop and think about that. And, and this is a common occurrence now. They literally come pouring out, I've watched the videos, they'll come pouring out of the streets in the cities, especially in Judea and Samaria, which is the West Bank, the west side of the Jordan, which is Palestinian uh, controlled mostly. That's where the Israelis have agreed that they would let the Palestinians govern themselves. You remember, not here, but we've talked about it in previous Bible studies, all the different, if you want to talk about states or provinces of Israel, they, it's, it's like here. It'd be more in the mind of, you look at the state of Indiana, and we have counties. On a size basis, that's pretty much what you have in Israel. And Israel's landmass-wise isn't much different than the state of Indiana. So you have these counties, and if you can imagine here in Indiana, these different counties, each county would be allowed to govern itself under a different set of rules. You, wouldn't, you don't have a, like a state government that says everybody's got to do this. Each, each county's got to uh, perform this way. Over there, some of, the, some of the counties, Israel proper, the Israel government, has control and does all the policing and security. And that would be like, say, Fayette County. They do everything Fayette County. But Franklin County could maybe be, well, Israel takes care of the utilities, things of that nature, but they let, them, they let the Palestinians govern and use their laws, the Sharia law, in that area. That, that's what we're talking about here. So that's why when something happens, the Jews killed the, Israel, the Palestinians, and that, like in Franklin County, would pour out on the streets and hand out county and celebrate that they killed another Jew. And that goes on. That's a daily basis now. This stuff is really accelerated. Um, I did note, I haven't verified this. We'll find out. It'll verify itself. After this last, last bombing, I think yesterday or late last night, they, uh, Israel has uh, elite army units similar to our Navy SEALs, Green Berets. Uh, I don't know if you know or not, there's such a thing as Blue Berets, which is an Air Force elite tactical teams, they have that type situation too where they're super trained people like our SEALs. They are preparing them to go into uh, Judea and Samaria, into the Palestinian areas to uh, pay back what's happened in the last few days with these bombings and the, the terrorist attacks. So there again, it's just stepping up the uh, pressure. Uh, also in Israel, we know that uh, Bibi Netanyahu, of course, got elected prime minister. He has until, I think it's the 28th, maybe I'm wrong on that day, but he had several weeks to form his coalition government, and it looked like it was going to be a very strong coalition. The problem has, there's a far-right group that would be like our far-right Republicans here at the state, very religious, they're called Zionists. And they've won six seats this time, and Netanyahu needs them in this coalition. Well, the United States is pushing him not to do that. And some of the, uh, the other parties in Israel are pushing him not to do that. These people believe in the old Jewish law. That's why they're called Zionists. And they are ultra-Orthodox Jews. They, they do all the old rites, rituals, and everything. And, but... Uh, the head of that, um, that group, um, Ozma is his first name, I can't think of his last name. He's wanting to either be defense minister in the new cabinet or finance minister. And he's saying, if I don't have one of those two jobs, we're not coming with you. So Israel may not, <laughs> not be any further down the line than they were six months ago uh, if they can't get this coalition put together. The, the far right groups holding up the coalitions, what it amounts to. The, um, in the Middle East, the IEA, which is the International uh, uh, Nuclear Group, uh, they say now, they admit publicly that Iran has enough 
enriched uranium for six bombs. And we knew that, we talked about that months back, that, uh, that even you can't believe what people are telling you. And it's obvious that the rate they've been enriching uranium, it wouldn't take them long to put it together. The thing of it is they have Russia, they have North Korea, and they have China, all three of them to help tell them how to put it together the right way. So you, that's, that's before us right now. Um, Israel is going to have to act if they're going to prevent them actually putting a bomb together and using it. So they've got enough material to make it. Don't know where they've made it yet or not. Nobody's admitting to that, but if anyone knows, Israel will know, and they will react to it. They, they don't have any choice. It's an it's a, a existential problem for them. If they allow around and get the bomb, Israel's toast. They will use it. They've said they're going to use it. And their only job is to drive Israel into the sea and remove all the Jews from the world. And they tell you that every day. Now, in Iran, the thing that's probably impeding them some now is the riots that we've been talking about the last several weeks. There's been over 500 deaths this last week. Uh, serious, serious clashes going on. The army's trying to control things and the people are just standing up to the army, uh, getting killed. Uh, there's, uh, they've got people jailed, they've got people getting ready to go to trial. But uh, right now the uh, Iran does, government does not have control of the situation, it's obvious. Uh, I mentioned that Turkey's attacking the Kurds in, in Syria and Iraq. We move up the map a little bit, talk about the Ukrainian war. Today, Russia took out supposedly what was the last 14 utility plants left in Ukraine. They, they uh, took 14, there were 14 different plants that were still producing electricity. They are not now. Uh, three of those plants were nuclear plants. All three are shut down. And uh, also today out of that, Moldova, which is a little country, not part of NATO. It sets between Romania and Ukraine. It's just a little country down in the southwest corner. Uh, they had, they've had some rockets land on them, obviously mistakenly, uh, like that rockets we were talking about here a couple weeks ago that uh, they thought was Russian that landed in uh, Poland, but they weren't. They were Ukrainian. One thing I have not been able, but so anyhow, Ukraine, for all practical purposes, is without water, the cities, without water and no electricity, and no chance of bringing it back online. Russia has pretty much completed what they set out to do. Uh, I saw this picture, don't know, I haven't verified it yet, so take it with a grain of salt, I'll let you know next week. But one of the rockets that was fired at the nuke plant they took a picture of it. You can see the tail fins. You can see the numbers on the sign. And guess whose rocket it was? United States. It was obviously the United States. It, it looks like it's an AIM-21 uh, common rocket that we have. That it's a United States weapon and obviously fired by the Ukrainians. And it wasn't like an errant missile. This missile was fired at towards a nuclear plant. So that's, I've been this way all along. You, Ukrainians, the Ukrainian country's always been corrupt. Ever since they stepped away from the Soviet Union, it's been totally corrupt. And um, it's, the government's just, I mean, it, everything's, people, everybody over there are bribed. And it's just so much illegality going on there's just so much corruption, it's just beyond belief. But yet, they want us here, they want, our congressmen want us in the Biden administration, want us to believe that, you know, there are white, white glove people over there and we need to support them and help them and all this way. The other thing that's going on with that, they, they are admitting, even the administration's admitting now, we have no idea where most of the arms we sent over there are. Uh, they've gone on the black market. And a lot of that always happens. Same thing happened in, in Iraq. We ship all this stuff over there, there's no accountability, and it goes to the highest bidder. It's kind of like back while we talked about the, the 
shipments of food to go to places. No accountability. We just ship it, just ship it, and spend a lot of bucks doing that. But anyhow, it will be interesting to see what the explanation is going to be on this uh, AIM 120 uh, rocket that was found near U a Ukrainian plant. It's American made. Look over at China for a few minutes. China's starting to lock down again. Um, the, uh, they, they, they keep thinking that the key to keeping people getting COVID is to lock down a city when the COVID breaks out there. And they've had nowhere near that they report, they've had nowhere near the numbers that we had of people sick. But as we talked about before, it's no big deal other than to us, other than it is disrupting the supply chains. And uh, stuff's just not getting made and getting shipped. I mentioned here a couple weeks ago about when they locked down the apple plant and they had people climbing the fences trying to get out of the factory area. They had a riot there this week the people that was still there. Um, they evidently have brought in some of the army to help keep the plant operating. And uh, the employees that were there want to go home. And they won't let them go home. They've been in there now for a month. And so there was a pretty good riot on that. And some, there were some people severely hurt. BRI, which is the <clears throat> excuse me, Brick Road Initiative that we've talked about that China does, They've been doing this for some time. <clears throat> if you remember back when I talked about it before, it's, it's uh, similar to the colonization that uh, we did and European countries did back in the 17, 1800s, where you go in, you build everything for everybody, and then you end up owning it. Well, think about this. China right now has control of 96 seaports in 53 countries. To the point that if they decided they wanted to shut down a port, China, not the country, that it, where it's at, China could shut it down. So stop and think about the stranglehold they have on everybody's economy. We have 96 ports in 53 countries. And, and the problem we've got going on is all this stuff's coming about. The Biden administration is basically ignoring China. It's really sad. I don't know if you saw... Um, China's meeting with Jinping. Um, Jinping embarrassed him, Biden, severely, talked down to him. And the same thing happens to our Secretary of State and the other people, high, high administration people that's involved with China. Almost every week now, some Chinese official is dressing them down, just treating them like they're nothing, and talking to them in turn, dictating to them. And the whole reason this is going on is because Biden want, thinks that he can get China to sign a climate agreement, a climate treaty. That's what Biden wants to hang his hat on, that he turned the world climate, helped turn everything around on the climate. And uh, the largest polluter in the world of the environment today is China, and they have absolutely no desire to put any money into cleaning it up. And we're ignoring it. So that, that's not going to get any better. Now, why is that important? Let's talk climate change a minute. Did you pick up on what the last thing the Pope wanted to do? You noticed a couple weeks ago, I think Pastor talked about it last week, where they had the Ten Commandments for Climate, and they climbed up the mountain, and they broke the tablets and symbolic you guys are all familiar with that, right? Okay. Guess what the Pope's asking for now? He wants you to go back to eating fish on Friday. Why? So you're not eating red meat because red meat, those cows we have running around, produce methane gas, and they're polluting the environment. He wants you to eat fish on Fridays. He wants you to fast for the climate. Now, we've seen two things come out now. We've seen this Ten Commandment thing, reenacting what happened with Moses and the Israelites. Now, we're taking something that belongs to God in that 
Anyone know when eating fish first started? When the when it was first done and why? Sometime around 100 AD, there was a pope by the name of Nicholas, N-I-C-O-L-A-S, and Pope Nicholas, in reverence to Jesus, declared that they should eat, they should fast from red meat on Friday. Reason being, warm-blooded animal. Jesus, warm-blooded. No red meat, eat the fish, and it was, it was to honor Jesus. That's why he did that at that time. In honor of Jesus, and they did it on Fridays. That's why it's Friday. What day, what day was, was Christ purportedly crucified? On Friday. So Pope Nicholas at that time said, okay, look, in honor of Jesus, 100, roughly 100 to 150 years, not exactly sure of the date, after Christ was died, after Christ died on the cross, Pope Nicholas said, okay, here's what we're going to do in honor of Jesus. Today's Pope is saying in honor of climate to give patronage to the climate God, don't eat fish on Fridays. So you see a trend developing here, and it's not a good trend. And we've known all along, I mean, with this Pope, he's been nothing but uh, on the top of the climate thing with everything he's been doing. So anyhow, I, I, that's, that's really striking. I would throw out a couple of things when we're talking about climate. Many universities now, it's, it's back to what we've talked in there before about indoctrination, how we've allowed them to indoctrinate our little kids in school. That's what's going on with the transgender stuff now, and that's what's been going on with these gay parades and the, having the uh, transgenders come in and read to the kids and these books that... Uh, are in our libraries. I, I, I didn't write this down. I read it the other day. Maybe you're aware of it. There was a mother, I believe, in either Wyoming or Colorado. She came to a school board meeting, and she brought a book in with her, and she stood up, and she started reading out of this book. And it was one of these books on transgender and LBGT and everything explaining sex acts to the kids. They called her out of order and told her that's not fit to be read in here. And she looked them squarely in the face and said, kids are reading it in your library. Yeah. These books are... And it's all back to the indoctrination thing. Now, we know one reason the trouble we're in today with the indoctrination of our people or young people at colleges over the years. That's been going on since back in the late 50s, early 60s. And today they are now, some of the colleges, and this is probably a trend that's gonna get pushed quite a bit. You have to have a climate study in your curriculum or you don't graduate. It's mandatory. It's a mandatory climate study curriculum as part of your four years of college or six years or eight years, whatever you're doing. But we're not going to give you your degree. You either take it or leave it, one of the two. And there's already a handful of colleges that's put this in play. One thing I did pick up this last week, um, I talked about, I think week four last, about I watched this one study. They were talking about how really the Earth's not warming, hasn't been. Uh, on the records, and it, these guys really had this stuff verified. There, it was no. There had been so much of the data that they went back and changed to reflect what they wanted it to say. But uh, this study just come out that our seas, in particular the Pacific Ocean, Southern Pacific Ocean, is what's called. You probably heard them talking about the La Nino and the La Nina. That cold air, that cold water that, that comes from the western Pacific to the east and wells up against South America, and it influences our weather. That's the reason we're having the weather we have right now, is due to that. This third year in a row, the sea is showing record cold. Never been this cold in recorded history. The other thing that's going on, since 2012, 
they have shown that the sea ice, which we've told is all melting and causing the world to flood, has been increasing. This year alone, the Eskimos up around Hudson Bay, due north of us, up in northern Canada, they are right now hunting polar bears on the ice around Hudson Bay. They haven't done that in 25 years. And the reason being, it's getting colder. It's not getting warmer. The seas are getting drastically colder. Antarctica ice is expanding, and the ice in the Arctic is expanding. But yet, we're all told that we've got to quit eating fish on Fridays to prevent global warming. So you just, you just have to take this stuff with a grain of salt. Let's talk about here in the USA for a few things. I don't know where you picked up or not. This, there's a lot of hubbub about this uh, world soccer games that's going on. Over in the Mideast, yeah, I agree with you, thumbs down. Our soccer team went all gay. Reason being, the reason our soccer team come out flying their colors and doing everything they can to highlight LBGT is because the Muslims over there said, we don't want the gays here. And they don't. I mean, you know, it's, it's funny how the uh, major media, they don't want to talk about this, but I mean, if you're, you're found out to be gay in most Muslim countries, you're in trouble. Uh, they're they're going to kill you. And uh, so anyhow, they said, oh, there, no beer. That was their thing. No alcohol in the stadium. All they can serve is no non-alcoholic beer. And they didn't want any of the gays. And the third thing they did with the soccer games is the Muslims are, out, are allowed to proselytize at the games. They have a mosque set up. They're, I've watched a video today, pulling people in, proselytizing to them. They showed a guy getting converted from Christianity to being a Muslim right there because he was there from the gangs. I forget what country he was from. But um, our soccer team was all part of that. Here's the thing here in the States, a couple just side notes, and I'll be done here in a second. Um, be careful of the news reading the headlines, just like I said here tonight, this story about this AIM-120 missile that's American-made, it may or may not, that picture, that video I saw today may or may not be true. They can make anything look real. So you gotta be really careful of that. But what happens here in the States, you're probably all aware of the Colorado shooting at the gay club. Probably everybody, everybody media jumped on that. Well, who was to blame for it? Republican media. If you look at all the major media responses, it was all about Republicans, Christians, and the far right. Well, lo and behold, guess who the guy that did the shooting is? He's a, how they put, non-binary. Okay? He's one of them. But yet, the Republicans, the Christians, and every, everybody that the media wants to blame for this stuff were blamed immediately. Of course, Biden come out, got to have more gun control. And uh, that's, it's just, you got to be careful because if they, like there, if they had verified who this guy was before they announced what his intentions were, they wouldn't, they would have known this guy as a non-binary, whatever that means. And I'll be honest with you, I can't keep up with it. I quit trying. It's just, it's nuts. Uh, there's no logic to it whatsoever. The, um, you want to watch the House, who becomes the House Speaker once the election gets over, and it's still not over by a long ways yet. Uh, but there's some interesting politics going on because we do have a group of conservative Republicans that appears to be holding their ground in the House. And it's going to be interesting to see what comes out of this. Um, here's a little side note, and then I've got one good news. Do you realize there are more bureaucrats in this country? Now, bureaucrats, I'm talking about people that work for USDA, uh, Homeland Security, uh, all these people that run all these offices, okay? CDC and all this stuff. Do you realize that they have more people, more bureaucratic people, with the authority to own and carry firearms and are urged to do so 
than all the people we have in the United States Marine Corps? Stop and think about that for a minute. Pastors talked about numerous times about where, why, just like USDA, you do, you know, U.S. Department of Agriculture. I forget how many million rounds of ammo and guns they bought over the last few years. The Department of Agriculture? Think about that. But there are more bureaucrats right now authorized to carry weapons in this country than we have in the United States Marine Corps. There's 187,000 people uh, in the Marine Corps right now, active duty Marine Corps. There are more bureaucrats than that that's licensed and have the ability to carry weapons and arm themselves in the course of their line of work. Good news, we got some good news tonight. Uh, Representative McCarty seems to be the one that's gonna be elected to the Speaker of the House. Like I said, you wanna watch this because it's not a done deal yet. I've got just a minute here, I'll throw in a, a, something you may watch which is interesting. I ask you a question, do you have to be a member of the House of Representatives to be the Speaker of the House? The answer is no. A lot of people don't realize that. They think if you're Speaker of the House, you have to be elected Congress. Nope. The Congress, the 435 members, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents together can get their heads together and they can choose anybody they want to to be the Speaker of the House. <laughs> right now, the name being thrown out that if McCarty, if the Republicans, the Republicans got to come up with a majority to elect McCarty the Speaker now, stop and think about that, there's 435 members, you got to have 218 votes to make him Speaker of the House. Well, they've only got 200 and right now I think there's 223 or four confirmed Republicans, but about 30 of them are in this conservative group I'm talking about, that just talked about a minute ago. If they don't all vote together, the Democrats can get together with the other Republicans and they can vote in, and they're talking about right now, Liz Cheney of all people, to vote her in as Speaker of the House. Wouldn't that be a hoot? But anyhow, McCarty's going to be the Speaker. I pray that he is. Looks like he should be able to, to make that. He says right up front, we will pray every day. So that'll be a big change from where we've been. He will start every session of Congress with a prayer and with the Pledge of Allegiance. So that's a big, a big deal. Let me read you a scripture right quick. We talk about so many things and... and uh, you know, the one thing that's given me so much peace over the last few years, I'm just ashamed that it took me so long to learn this, but to live every day for the day and not worry about things out in the future. Just get up and worry about the day every day. And uh, I strive to do that stronger and stronger, and I've been so much happier doing that. And it's back on this stuff, just like we're talking about now. You, you don't have to understand all this stuff we're talking about. It's interesting to stay on top of it. And, and the, Jesus himself told us, you need to know the weather. Just like I said a while ago, we got a red evening. We should have a gray morning tomorrow morning. That means it's a gay, good day to travel in this area. It's the old sailor thing. Evening red, morning gray sends a traveler on his way. If you got a red morning, sailor take warning. So that's what Jesus was talking about. How, how is it you can know all this stuff about the weather but you can't discern the sign of the times. So we should, we should have knowledge of what's going on, and that's what we're trying to do. And I thank the pastor for letting me come up and do this. But here's the bottom line. It says, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. You don't, and what they're saying, is, you know, we're being told there, you don't have to understand everything that's going on. It's back to trust. It says, seek his, seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. And that's the way we need to be living every day. We don't have to understand all this stuff. Uh, it's, I think it's a good tool, and I think that's the way the pastor, and I know uh, Bishop thinks this way too, that if things unfold the way we think they're going to, and if you were in Ukraine right now, there's probably over there, peop there's people, we know there's people over there under tremendous distress. And if you're a good Christian, 
you need to understand the big picture as much as you can to help give them peace and to keep them in close to you so you got a chance to, to talk to them about Jesus. That's, that's what we're do, why we're doing this, is so everyone is as knowledgeable as it can be. So anyhow, thank you for your time. I hope you all have a great Thanksgiving. Enjoy the families. Pastor, it's all yours. <laughs>